Beliefs about vampires, werewolves, witches, and wizards are widespread. Exactly what is a serial killer? Our house uh, was two rooms, and there was seven of us. He held the bat like this. That's why I have characters who sort of expose themselves. And everybody always say, Coach Carter, Samuel Jackson is taller than you. I said, I know, but I think I'm better looking. Well, thank you, and thanks for coming out today. Uh, and thank you to Bill and the Department of History and Political Science for inviting me back, um, and to the college and the university as well for the support for this. Uh, it's great to be back on campus um, after having spent 15 years here. And uh, as Bill mentioned, eight years ago I left uh, to go to the Army's Command and General Staff College. And really, at the time, there were only two jobs that I would have left Southeastern for. One would have been in Ireland, which doesn't surprise Bill. The other was this position at the Command and General Staff College. Bill, you want to go to the next slide? And just let me give you a quick word on that, sort of as a public service announcement uh, as part of the, the faculty there at the Staff College. Most of you probably aren't familiar with it. It's part of the professional military education system uh, in the United States and specifically for the Army. Most of you are probably familiar with the Military Academy at West Point, right? An undergraduate school that grants degrees and commissions officers. Some of you are probably familiar with the War College, uh, which is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The Command and General Staff College sort of falls in the middle between those two institutions. Uh, it's a one-year program for military officers. Most of them have been in service for 10 to 12 years. Uh, typically in their early to mid-30s, and they've been tagged by the military for future advancement uh, in the Army. Uh, the officers I've got, uh, it's a one-year program. They're there for about, uh, they're, well, they're there for a year, typically about 1,100 over the course of the year. The vast majority of them are Army officers. Uh, however, we always have a contingent of Air Force, Marine, and Naval officers as well, along with a handful of other government agencies. And in those 1,100 or so, there's typically about 100 to 110 international officers uh, from 88 to 90 different countries every year. And they come and they spend a year at Fort Leavenworth in class every day with American counterparts. Their families get together for cookouts. And they build relationships that they will then play upon over the course of their career. Right now at NATO headquarters in Europe, I can say with certainty there are American officers serving with international officers who know each other as very good friends from the year they, they spent together there at Fort Leavenworth. Uh, they take classes in things like tactics, logistics, no surprise. And for me, they get some military history. And I will say, as I, as I said a moment ago, it's only one of the only two jobs I would have left Southeastern for. And I consider it really a, a privilege every day to be able to walk in and deal with those, those kind of individuals. They are simply outstanding. Uh, and they've got a great responsibility entrusted with, with the defense of, of our country. But today I'm here to talk about glory. And it's nice to be here to, to mark and celebrate uh, Black History Month. I think this wraps up uh, the speaker series. Uh, so it, it's really uh, great to be here to talk about glory. How many of you have seen glory? Ooh, more than I would have thought because it's like 35 years old. It's been around a long time now. But it is really a, an outstanding film now. Historians, myself, Dr. Robinson included, and some of my colleagues out there in, in the audience, we will readily point out that history films, history-based films are often factually challenged. That might be generous to say, factually challenged. And while I, I fully agree that historical films are just plagued with, with inaccuracies, and when history competes with Hollywood, sometimes history does score a point or two. But in most cases, the Hollywood is going to win out over the, the, the actual history element. And <clears throat> historically based films, Bill, you can go to the next slide. Historian, uh, historically based films have been around almost as long as there have been movies. Uh, one of the first historically, historically based films and war movies was this movie, Birth of a Nation, 1915. And it's, it's about the American Civil War, and it is now legendary for the racial stereotypes and tropes, epic proportion, the stereotypes in, in this film. Its director, next, 
was this man, D.W. Griffith. And despite the inaccuracy of that film, Griffith was one of the leading individuals at the start of the film industry. And for our purposes, he made three predictions about historical films. Number one, he said, is that most Americans would get their historical knowledge from films. Secondly, he said that movies have a greater emotional impact on people than books or classrooms. And lastly, he said that historically based films would offer an accurate and authentic window into the past. Now, the last point is pretty problematic. But his first two points are worth reconsidering again. And that's sort of the angle I want to take it in thinking about Glory and, and any other historically based films, war movies included, of course. Those, those first two points, and, and one being, again, that our historical knowledge will come from films and that films give us an emotional tie to the past. I want to put those together into a single proposition, and that is that for many of us, really, I think that historical movies provide one of our few emotional links to the past. Uh, you know, most of us have seen the interviews of the typical person on the street asked historical questions, right? His history questions about the United States. And really what that demonstrates in so many cases is that a lot of Americans have essentially no or just an awful understanding of American history. And despite what uh, right, every, every news person on a cable network uh, seems to think, scanning a Wikipedia page just does not make you a historical expert. But for typical Americans, I think one of the reasons that there is this lack of knowledge about American history is that there's a lack of feeling. There's a lack of emotional connection. There's nothing that really draws our hearts to the past. And for most of us, I think, our hearts have to go before our heads do. And so this is one of the values, I think, of historically based films, even with their inaccuracies, is that they can do a degree, honestly, historians out there, they can reach people an emotional level that, that we rarely can achieve through our books and our classrooms. So with those initial observations, let's go on to talk about glory. This is a 1989 film, and starring, of course, Denzel Washington, Matthew Broderick, Morgan Freeman, and it's the story of the Massachusetts 54th Regiment of Volunteers, an African-American unit, and its white commander, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, that Matthew Broderick plays. It was nominated for five Academy Awards, uh, won three, one for cinema, the best cinematography, one for the best sound, and of course Denzel Washington for best supporting actor with just a, an amazing performance. Now right off the bat, one of the inaccuracies of this film is the film suggests really that the men of the 54th were the first African American unit to fight in the Civil War, which simply was not true. Almost from the beginning of the war when the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter in South Carolina in April of 1861, there were calls to arm African-American men to fight in this war, which really isn't all that surprising given that everyone knew at the time and acknowledged as much that slavery was the primary cause of the war. Yes, there were some other issues, but slavery was the primary cause. Well, one of the first attempts to organize a black unit to fight in the war was done by this man, General David Hunter, who was commander of Union forces along the southeastern coast of the United States, little pockets along the coast that the Confederates had, had not taken over. And he put together what he labeled as the first South Carolina colored infantry. Now, as soon as President Lincoln heard about this, he sent General Hunter a memo saying, no, we are not prepared to do this. This exceeds your authority as a military commander and this is well beyond any policy that the United States has adopted at this point. But that was the first attempt. Then just a few months later, in August of 1862, this man, James Lane, who was a US senator in Kansas at the time, he became a brigadier general and he organized the first Kansas colored infantry, not necessarily the inspiring military commander that most of us think when we, when we take a look at him. 
However, once again, the first Kansas colored infantry did not have official US government sanction. Now they did participate in a couple of skirmishes out, which was really the frontier at this point. They would eventually be accepted into US service, but at this point, not really. Now at the same time, in August of 1862, down in New Orleans, General Benjamin Butler, also maybe not the most inspiring of military commanders, he organizes, or actually accepted into service, two black militia units in the New Orleans area, the 1st and 3rd Louisiana Native Guards. Now, the 1st Louisiana was made up of free men of color from the New Orleans area. The 3rd Louisiana was made up of formerly enslaved African-American men from the Louisiana area. And they, too, would eventually be accepted into federal service. And I'll mention them again in just a moment. Now, one of those in the United States, one individual in the United States who was encouraging, advocating, even pleading with the Lincoln administration to accept, you can go back one, Bill, to accept black soldiers into US service was Frederick Douglass. Now, Douglass had been born into slavery, escaped as a young man, and prior to the American Civil War, he became one of the loudest advocates for abolition, and then when the war begins, the arming of African American men. He was nationally known, a nationally known figure at this point. And what Douglas argued was this. This is no time to fight only with your white hand and allow your black hand to remain tied. Men in earnest don't fight with one hand when they might fight with two. A man drowning would not refuse to be saved even by a colored man. Well, at this point of the war, this early in the war, President Lincoln here was reluctant to move too quickly on accepting black men into service. This was again beyond the policy of the United States. It was, a, it was in some ways beyond the sentiments of those even in the North who said supported abolition. And in the same month again of August 1862, Lincoln responded in a letter to a man named Horace Greeley who was the editor of the New York Tribune, uh, Tribune, one of the major newspapers in the United States at the time. And Lincoln explained his thinking on this. He told Greeley, my paramount objective in this struggle is to save the Union. It is not either to save or destroy slavery. Lincoln went on to say in this letter that if he could save the Union by freeing all of the slaves, he would. If he could free it by freeing none of the slaves, he would. If he could save the Union by freeing some and not other slaves, he would. His paramount objective was to save the Union. But by the late summer now of 1862, just really a few short weeks later, Lincoln came to accept Douglas's logic about the abolition of slavery. And with that, Lincoln put together to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. That would go into effect on January the 1st, of 1863, just a few months later. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation, as many of you are aware, I, I believe, did not abolish the institution of slavery. It would take the 13th Amendment to do that. But instead, what the proclamation did was to free those slaves in areas of the country that were in rebellion. For our purposes, though, there was a clause in the Emancipation Proclamation that did say African-American men would be accepted into service. What it said was that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States. And with that, African-American men serving in the United States Army became official government policy. Now, many in the North celebrated the proclamation and this acceptance of black men into US service. But not everyone was happy about this. As an example, the head of the Republican Party in Illinois, Lincoln's home state, and of course he was a Republican himself, a man he knew quite well, wrote to Lincoln, James Conkling was his name, wrote to Lincoln and said, if you do not repeal this Emancipation Proclamation, I will no longer support you, your administration, or the war effort. In his response, Lincoln really cut to the heart of matter as he was so able to do. And this is what he said. You say you will not fight to free the Negroes. Some of them seem willing to fight 
for you. But no matter, fight you then exclusively to save this union. Now, one who did recognize the significance of Lincoln's steps in the Emancipation Proclamation was once again Frederick Douglass. And what he said about this was, once let the black man get upon his person the, black, the, the letters U.S. Let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. And there is no power on earth which can deny that he has earned the right of citizenship in these United States. Even those on the other side of the conflict recognize the validity of Douglas's argument here. A Georgian and Confederate general named Hal Cobb acknowledged as much, and I imagine he did so reluctantly, when he said, the day you make soldiers of them is the beginning of the end of our revolution. If slaves will make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong. Well, by the following summer of 1863, thousands of black men were signing up to serve in the United States Army. Over 200,000 would serve before the end of the war. And in order to better organize those, union, the, uh, those units, the War Department created what became known as the United States Colored Troops, or USCT. And if any of you travel to Port Hudson, the battlefield there where there's a national cemetery, there are any number of headstones with names and USCT inscribed on them for men who had served in the Army. Well, the film Glory's Postscript, at the very end there's some text that comes across uh, sort of wrapping things up. And one of the points it makes, it claims, is that because of what the 54th does, Congress at last authorized the raising of black troops throughout the Union, which simply was not true. There had been engagements that I'll mention in a moment well before the 54th became engaged. Uh, so Congress had already made that step. The Lincoln administration already had moved that step to raise black units. Well, one of the earliest and most significant unit-sized fights from an African-American unit in the war came on May 27th in 1863, just north of Baton Rouge at Port Hudson. And it was there that the first and third Louisiana Native Guards that I mentioned before made an assault against Confederate positions. Confederates had de deployed along high bluffs overlooking the flat floodplain along the Mississippi River that the first and third were going to assault against. On that day, the first and third formed up in line of battle in a tree line and then moved out into that open ground between themselves and the Confederates. As they moved forward at about 200 yards, they advanced about 200 yards when they began to take heavy artillery and small musket fire. One of their officers, black officers, a captain named Andre Callot, was shouting out orders in English and in French, even after he was hit in his left arm, which sort of hung lifeless as he advanced forward. At about 200 further yards, he was hit again, mortally wounded, and at 200 yards from the Confederate position, the men began to fall back. Those who had witnessed the assault said they were hunched over like they were advancing into a heavy headwind as they were taking so much fire. Witnesses on both sides accounted to the determination and bravery of these men as they made this assault, but they eventually proved unsuccessful in getting to the Confederate position. Well, just over a week later, on June the 7th, 1863, still in Louisiana, at a place called Milliken's Bend, which is just across the Mississippi River from Vicksburg. And it was in Vicksburg where Ulysses S. Grant's army had trapped another Confederate army, a Confederate army, in the town of Vicksburg. Four African-American regiments on the west side of the river fought off a determined Confederate attack trying to get into Vicksburg to help their colleagues there in the city. They endured heavy volley fire and then hand-to-hand -hand fighting before forcing the Confederates back. One of those regiments suffered 45% killed or mortally wounded, one of the highest casualty rates of any unit involved on either side during the war. Well, now let's turn to the 54th. 
The idea for an African-American regiment in Massachusetts originated with the state's governor, a man named John Andrew, who was a committed abolitionist, as many in Massachusetts were at the time. And the 54th organized in January of 1863, so right after the Emancipation Proclamation came out. And the, the 54th was to be offered, uh, officered by the sons of prominent New England families, those who had had combat experience earlier in the war. And although this was a state regiment, African-American men from across the North volunteered to come and join the 54th, including two of Frederick Douglass's sons who joined that, that unit. Well, in April of 1863, Governor Andrews selected this man, Robert Gould Shaw, to be the commander of the Massachusetts 54th. Shaw was 26 years old at the time, born in Boston, from a prominent New England family. And when the war began, he volunteered immediately and served in the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry in earlier fights in the war. Some of the battles he was in was at Winchester and Cedar Creek, most notably Antietam which was a horrendous fight in Maryland. And when Shaw was tagged to take command of this unit, he was reluctant because he knew that by accepting this position of an African-American unit, he would likely face criticism, if not isolation, from the rest of the United States Army. Even more reluctant, he was because of his own self-doubts. He didn't believe he had the ability to command any unit of regimental size. And in that case, we're talking about 1,000 or so men. Quite young, had his own self-doubts. But nevertheless, he agreed to take command of the unit. Now, Shaw, as best as we know, was not the rather timid officer that we see in the film. Instead, he was very firm, very fair, and absolutely committed to training his men for the fight that he envisioned that they would eventually end up in as the war uh, would progress on. And as for the men in the unit, they were equally committed to their training and expectations of getting into the fight. One of the sergeants in the unit made the observation when they were facing the early challenges that the film depicts quite well of they couldn't get uniforms, they couldn't get weapons. Uh, he, he said in reference to the, the lack of rifles, but we had been to the armory of God and had received weapons of the heart. That made us daring and dangerous foes, men to be reckoned with. Well, within really a few short weeks of Shaw taking command, the 54th was on its way south. And the first operation that the 54th was involved in was now the rather infamous raid at Darien, Georgia. And these, of course, are now images from the film, not, not from the period. The raid at Darien, Georgia was an expedition along the Georgia coastline. And it was commanded by another white officer named James Montgomery. And Darien, the small town, was found essentially abandoned. And Colonel Montgomery ordered his men, which was an African-American unit as well, he ordered both of the units to first plunder the town and then burn it. Shaw protested. He said, this is an illegal order. It is an immoral order. But Colonel Montgomery outranked Shaw and just simply ignored Shaw's protest. And the men moved forward, as they've been ordered to do, and burned the town down. Shaw wrote afterwards of, of his embarrassment and his disgust, especially at what his well-disciplined men were asked to do there at Darien. The first real fight that the 54th got engaged in was not long after that, in the middle of July, July the 16th of 1863, not far from Charleston, South Carolina, on James Island. And it was there in an early morning battle, they faced Confederate units toe to toe. And they first engaged with significant volley fire back and forth with their muskets. Then the 54th withstood a bayonet charge and hand to hand fighting. And by fighting off the Confederates, they ended up protecting another unit, the 10th Connecticut, which was a white unit. And when this battle was over, veterans of the 10th Connecticut said that the 54th that day had fought like heroes. 
And Shaw especially was gratified in seeing what his men had, had done, for they had stood as men, shoulder to shoulder, with white soldiers, and they had done their job. Well, best known of the 50 force involvement in the war was the climactic scene of the film itself, in which they make an assault on Fort Wagner, which was part of the defenses of Charleston Harbor. After the fight on James Island on July 16th, the 54th did an all-night march, and on the 17th they went into camp anticipating the assault against Fort Wagner the following day. Now, Fort Wagner was manned by about 1,700 Confederate soldiers. They had 17 artillery pieces, cannons, as part of the fortification. The fort was surrounded by a three-foot deep moat, three-foot deep moat, and it was a formidable obstacle. And despite having to make the assault over a mile of open beach, Shaw volunteered the 54th, about 650 men at this point, Shaw volunteered them to lead the assault. Other regiments would follow, but the 54th was going to lead the way. Late in the afternoon of the 18th, the 54th formed up on the beach, waiting for the command to advance. And at that point, the brigade commander, the general who oversaw their unit, a man named George Strong, rode up on a horseback. And he encouraged the men, telling them, do not stop to fire. Get across that open ground as soon as you can, and then rely on the bayonet. If you stop, you're in the killing zone. Now in the film, we see Colonel Shaw facing his men, and he points at the flag bearer. And Shaw asks, if this man should fall, who will lift the flag and carry on? His African-American boyhood friend, Thomas, steps forward and says, I will. In actuality, it was General Strong who asked if the flag bearer should fall, who will lift the flag? And it was Colonel Shaw who said, I will. And this is not inconsequential, because what Shaw demonstrated to his men by doing that is that he was going to be at the front. He was going to endure every risk that they faced. He was going to lead them. He could have taken up a position in the rear. It would have been acceptable. But he decided he was going to lead them. And then the 54th moved out. First at the quick step, which is a moderate paced walk, and then at the double quick, looking to get across that open killing ground as rapidly as they could. They soon began to take artillery fire from the Confederates and then small arms fire. But with Shaw at the front leading the way, they made their way to the moat at the base of the fortification, began crawling their way up to get into the fortification. Shaw was on top of the wall getting into the fort when he was struck in the chest by a bullet. He fell back down into the moat among his men, likely killed almost instantly. The man bearing the flag did fall. The man who picked it up was this man, Sergeant William Carney. And despite having been wounded in both legs, one arm and in the chest, he continued up the wall of the fort to plant the flag on the front of the fortification. Well, other units followed after the 54th and after some pretty heavy hand-to-hand -hand fighting for a couple of hours, the soldiers eventually withdrew under the cover of night. They never made their way actually into the fort. One of those who did make it back to the lines was Sergeant Carney here, and for his actions that day, he was later awarded the Medal of Honor. No other assaults were made against Fort Wagner. It was deemed impossible to take. Eventually, it would fall by siege operations, but not by an assault like the 54th had attempted. The film gives the impression that after this assault at Fort Wagner, the war was over for the 54th, which simply was not true. The 54th, even with the loss of Colonel Shaw, continued to fight throughout the war, most notably at the Battle of Lusty in Florida in February of 1865. In 1897, over 30 years after the war, this monument that we see in this photograph, 
to the 54th was dedicated on Boston Common with a number of the veterans of the unit there, and we see some of them here in this photograph. It was designed by the sculptor Augusta saint Gaudin, and it's, it's, you can see it's 11 feet high, 14 feet wide. It's, it's an impressive monument. So what are we to make of this film's attempt at recreating history? Well, first let me say again, yes, I agree with my historian colleagues that historical films are just plays, plagued with falsehoods and incorrect facts. And glory is no exception for the, the handful of errors that I've mentioned along with some others that, that I haven't mentioned. But let, let's remember, historical films are not documentaries. They're not designed to be that factual to that degree. And second, let me go back to the proposal that I, I sort of began our, our time uh, together with, that for most Americans, Historical films really provide one of their few emotional links to the past. And when movie makers set out to make a film, more movies or otherwise, I expect one of their hopes is to make an emotional connection to their audience. And those who make war movies, I think, often attempt to do this, create an emotional connection through depictions of camaraderie and courage and sacrifice. And here, at least, I think, where more movies do successfully convey, if not absolute, objective, historical fact, they do represent at least a symbolic truth about the past and about war. Another classic illustration of this is the film Saving Private Ryan, I'm sure many of you have seen. And it's that first 30 minutes where we see Tom Hanks' character, Captain Miller, struggling, crawling out of the water on Omaha Beach on June the 6th, 1944, D-Day. And in that scene, what we see is Captain Miller witnessing the realities of combat and experiencing, reacting as any normal human being would. He is dazed, he is shocked, he is paralyzed, and we can empathize with him. But that scene also shows another reality. And that is that individuals, ordinary men like Captain Miller, overcame that human response to do extraordinary things. Yet war movies remind us that ordinary people have done extraordinary things in the past. Washington's Continentals in facing down the British in the Revolution, men of the 54th making that assault against Fort Wagner, and all the real Captain Millers in our nation's history. Today, there seems to be so much that, in films and elsewhere, that really glorifies the degrading and the destructive and the darker side of our human experience. But movies like these, scenes like that of the 54th and its assault, against Fort Wagner, not only elicit emotion, but they remind us of the virtuous and the honorable and the best of our human nature. And to me, that's as much a historical fact as any objective bit of evidence. Well, even with its inaccuracies, Glory tells us the story of those who fought for liberty and freedom for themselves and for the nation. And Abraham Lincoln certainly understood this as well. And towards the end of the war, Lincoln, thinking about those self-evident truths upon which the nation was founded, that all are created in their inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, he said this. There will be some black men who remember that with silent tongue, with clenched teeth, with a steady eye and a well-poised bayonet, they have helped mankind on to this great consummation. While I fear there will be some white men unable to forget that with malignant hearts and deceitful speech, they have strove to hinder it. So while the facts may at times be fairly suspect, good historical films do 
have an ability to make an emotional connection, to draw our hearts to the past. And my hope as a historian is that where our hearts go, our heads will then follow. Thank you again for coming out to celebrate Black History Month with me. I appreciate your attendance. Um, I'll be happy to stick around for questions to talk about this or even current events off the record. Bill. Thank you.